So now we're going to talk about aeromedical factors. And again, this list is there available. Uh, hypoxia, we talked about that earlier. Uh, we didn't talk about too much about what the symptoms of hypoxia. Um, generally, you have that feeling of euphoria, not me, I get the headache. But ultimately, you're not thinking clearly, you're not functioning correctly, you can't manage what's going on. Hypoxia is just simply a lack of oxygen. Okay, how do I fix it? Descend to a lower altitude, breathe oxygen. It's a very simple thing to fix if I have that capability. Hyperventilation, this is where you're just breathing too fast and it's not getting down into your lungs. It's only air is getting this far, not, not really circulating. You breathe into a uh, paper bag, uh, take some nice, slow, deep breaths. Uh, you know, sometimes your passengers, they start hyperventilating, fly the airplane. What's going to happen? They do it too extreme, they'll pass out in their breathing, we're automatically go to normal, and then they'll come back too. And told you, no. <laughs> but, but fly your airplane first. And make sure they're not, you know, if they're starting to hyperventilate, you can't get them to slow down. Slide them back away from the control so they don't cause an extra problem there. Now, doesn't talking or singing sometimes Right, you can help? have them sing happy birthday or whatever. Sometimes yeah. that might yeah. slow that down. And again, they're just not getting the air out of their lungs to get uh, oxygenated air back in. Right. Okay, so they have to breathe more deeply. Uh, ear issues, these can be extremely painful. Okay, so if you're coming down too fast, your ears don't have time to equalize. Uh, you can yawn, uh, you can practice the Valsalva maneuver where you pinch your nose and blow and, and you'll feel it. Okay, if you're a scuba diver, you learn to do that to clear your ears as you're going down, uh, but it works in an airplane too. Uh, spatial disorientation. Okay, I'm looking outside, particularly at night, and there's no real defined horizon, and I start to believe that I'm in a turn when I'm not, or I believe I'm straight and level when I'm actually in a turn, uh, my brain doesn't correlate what I'm seeing outside. Okay, um, this is super common when I get into the clouds for the first time. Okay, but I told y'all, stay out of the clouds. All right. <laughs> uh, but that being said, if you're an inspirated pilot uh, and it's your first time in the clouds, you're going to experience, you're, there's a very good chance you're going to experience spatial disorientation. Happened to me. Yes. Did it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it is weird. Yeah. And, and there's nothing you can do except to focus on your instruments. Yeah. Okay. I've yelled at people and it's kind of like, we're almost in a 60 degree bank. Level your wings. Level your wings. Level your wings now. <laughs> you know, and you're like, okay, my airplane. <laughs> uh, motion sickness. Not a lot you can do about it. Uh, if it's you, you just kind of, you know, you may have to just deal with it. Uh, if it's your passenger, actually, cold water on the back of the neck. There's also a pressure point here between the bones and your wrist. You can put a little pressure there. That may alleviate it. Uh, make the passenger, let them fly the airplane. Do something to distract them. And so you can help them with that motion sickness. Carbon monoxide. Uh, this one is... Yeah, um, this is ugly. Okay, um, Lavina has purchased carbon monoxide detectors from our airplanes. They're small, you can buy them off Amazon. Far better than those silly little uh, dot things that you put there, okay? Because um, this one has a meter on it. I can look at the number and see that I have yeah, it's a digital carbon monoxide readout. or not. Right. Yeah, and back to the hypoxia. The hypoxia and carbon monoxide poisoning uh, essentially, my brain's not getting enough oxygen. Okay, hypoxia because I don't have enough oxygen available. The carbon monoxide because the carbon monoxide is bonded with my red blood cells and there's no room for those red blood cells to carry oxygen. The difference is um, my lips and my nail beds will be blue if I'm hypoxic. They will be cherry red, notwithstanding the lipstick, if, if I have carbon monoxide. Okay, if it's you, okay, uh, I've had carbon monoxide poisoning. I can highly recommend you avoid it, okay? Um, I lost three days. Don't remember anything for three days except the headache and how bad I felt.
but I don't from honest, you know, I wasn't in an airplane, thank goodness. Okay, but understanding on that particular occasion, I was using a power saw and going up and down the stairs, I was working on a cabin and I knew I had the headache. Um, basically, I was holding a hammer and my husband asked me to hand him the hammer and I was looking at it and I couldn't remember how to hand him the hammer. And I'm looking at it, looking at him, and I'm thinking, and then I just sort of went down. <laughs> and, you know, and that was my last memory, is not looking at it. So understanding, two minutes prior to that, I was using a power saw. I still have all my fingers. <laughs> and so you understand, if I'm in an airplane, and I think I'm hypoxic, I'm going to land immediately. Because I may not have but two minutes of useful consciousness. It's a scary, scary thing. And there's actually a YouTube video floating around out there about a guy. He passed out. The airplane landed itself. Mm -hmm. Wasn't a pretty no. landing. No. He yeah. survived, though. He comes to you on the ground in a crashed airplane. I haven't had a chance to watch it, but you're kind of like, oh my. this is bad, bad stuff. Okay, so carbon monoxide. And again, you're a little low two meters. Can't read the difference between... Uh, a red blood cell that's fat with oxygen and one that's fat with carbon monoxide. Okay, so the books all tell us open the windows and breathe fresh air. Okay, that's kind of like having, yeah, my margarita. <laughs> Slam that down and then give me coffee. I'm still going to be drunk. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. You can't, you know, you, you know, you can stop, stop adding to it, but I can't make it go away quickly. Um, stress, fatigue, dehydration, okay. A lot of people will say, well, I stopped here for a fuel stop. I got four more hours to go. I don't want to drink any liquid because I don't want to, I don't have a place to go. Okay, so that oxygen, I mean, so that dehydration is going to lower my blood volume and now it's going to make me more susceptible to hypoxia, among other things. So dehydration can be negative. Fatigue. Okay, Justin, uh, you go to Kansas. How, how, how long do you stay in Kansas each day when you go up there? Six hours? Probably. Okay, so you fly up there, and it's a three-hour flight up, and you there take care of business for six hours, and then you're going to fly home. How tired are you going to be when you get home? Super tired. But when you get up that morning and head out, you're thinking, oh, I can do this. You know, and so we don't know... Uh, but, uh, you know, like I say, the, when you look at accident analysis, we've had a lot of accidents that have occurred at the trip home for a business person taking, you know, they flew up, took care of business, and they flew home. And sometimes it's the four, end of a 14-hour day. I'm guilty. Okay. Uh, you're tired, but you can't anticipate how tired you're going to be. And then it's at night, and you just add that on to there. Uh, stress. Okay, anybody here ever made a bad decision because they were stressed out? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we know it works. Um, but you just kind of have to take a brief, deep breath and put the stress behind you. Easier said than done, but you can do the best you can. Uh, drugs, alcohol, over-the-counter medicines. Uh, over-the-counter medicines, diphenhydramine, Benadryl. You don't fly for 60 hours. Yes, two and a half days. That's some bad stuff. And that's how long it stays in your system. Okay. Uh, the AOPA website has a list of medications that you can take. And, you know, some people can't take an aspirin without falling asleep. Okay, you can't take aspirin and fly. Other people almost n doesn't affect them. So, but I have to, but if it says on the box, don't operate heavy machinery, you basically quadruple the time. I can take this medication every four to six hours. So six hours times four, I can't fly for 24 hours after I've taken that one may cause drowsiness. Okay, except for the Benadryl and that's when there's a little bit more. Uh, alcohol, I mentioned earlier, uh, it can have a lingering effect on your ability to function even though you're no longer uh, the .04 or anything else like that. And, um, and, you know, and then one thing you kind of like, okay, you buy your own airplane, you got friends that want you to do things, and you're like, I can always just go to the refrigerator. 
sorry, can't fly for eight hours. You have to call someone else. <laughs> so you can sometimes use this to your advantage. Uh, scuba diving. Uh, hopefully your scuba divers know when they can when they can fly. But decompression dives or it's a non-decompression dive. Um, generally speaking, we want to wait 24 hours before we put them in an airplane because the nitrogen in their body will off gas just like shaking up a Coke bottle and popping the top on it. And when that, ga when that gas bubbles out of their bloodstream, bad things happen, especially if the bubble gets to the brain. Okay, so, but again, they're aware of that, or they should be, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, aeromedical, anything else? Um, I think it goes without saying illness. Right, do we have the I'm safe checklist? Right. So the I is for illness, okay, uh, M is for medications, uh, the F is for fatigue, uh, A is for alcohol, the F is for fatigue, uh, the E is for eating or external pressures. Um, and that's it's for stress, which you said. Yes, yeah, ex uh, yeah, exactly, uh, missed that one. So if you're stressed out, and again, what constitutes stress, okay, uh, you know, if you had an adrenaline hit, you don't want to go fly. Okay, uh, you know, I was driving home from uh, giving a check ride or driving back, and there was this horrific accident on the highway. I mean, I, I thought it was two semis, but there were flashing lights and fires and all kinds of bad things, and I had come up on it right after, you know, I mean, they were still there, and I'm like, it was horrific. And I just remember thinking in the pit of my stomach, I was, you know, you're like, this is bad. And I went to the hotel room, get up the next morning and hear on the news, it was one semi that got split lengthwise because he hit the, uh, the post on a bridge. And oh the guy survived. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Talk about a lucky dude. But understanding, once I, you know, I mean, if I'd have seen that on the way to the airport, Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I need to reevaluate before I crawl in this airplane. If I see it the next day after I found out the guy was survived, I'm like, wow, wasn't he lucky? And so understanding what you, you know, if you've had a near death experience, you have an adrenaline hit. Okay, if you've got a loved one, you know, great grandma's 99 years old and sick and not expected to make it for another two or three days and you get the phone call, how's that going to affect you? Some people more than others. We can't, you know, we, we don't know how that's going to affect any given person. Okay, so do we need to take a... We do, we do. 